It's a true privilege for me today to introduce you to one of our most distinguished and most successful alums. But there's something even more important about Rick Caruso. He really likes the Pepperdine Law School and has been so generous and so gracious to us over the years. And I would also say his parents have been as well. So Rick, on behalf of all of us, we thank you for that great generosity. Rick Caruso is uh, one of the world's leading real estate developers. Known for the kind of real estate development where we care about the environment, we care about the community that we create, we care about what we do with the neighborhood, and we care that the law and development work as a special force for good. And LA has been the beneficiary of that by and large. His real estate developments, the Grove, the Pavilion at Westlakes, Calabasas, on and on, are the kinds of places that are not only good places to live, they are also the kind of places that cement communities and that give an opportunity for us to interact not just with retail, as most shopping centers are, but with living spaces, recreation spaces, green spaces, and good spaces for neighborhoods. But that's not all he does. He does so much good in the LA community. And I could start through the charities and the philanthropic uh, efforts that Rick and his family are involved in. But suffice it to say that the Caruso Family Foundation and Rick and his wife and his parents have touched so many people in Southern California, and in particular, touched children who need health care, who need food, who need good educations. The Carusos are there in Watts, in downtown LA, and throughout Southern California to try to raise that standard of living and raise the quality of life for children throughout Southern California. To say nothing of health care, religious institutions. Uh, most recently he was involved, he and the family were involved in the new chapel down at USC. And if you haven't been down to see it, you should. It is an inspiration of its own. Rick also has contributed so much time to uh, civic endeavors, having served uh, on several commissions, uh, police commission, water commission. He was president, I think, of the police commission when they selected a new uh, head of the police force for LA, uh, the city of Los Angeles. He volunteers, he does what every good lawyer does and what we challenge all of you to do, which is, yes, do well professionally, but carry that spirit of service and leadership and commitment to the community everywhere you go and touch lives of those less fortunate. We are so proud at Pepperdine Law School to count you as one of our distinguished graduates. Rick Caruso. Thank you, Dean. That was a very kind and very, very generous. I'm going to pull this out because I may wander if you don't mind. So I want to give you a, a two minutes of a background about my law school career. Everybody knows who I still call Dean Phillips, who was the Dean of the Pepperdine when I was here in law school. Uh, when I got here, uh, Dean Phillips had black hair. When I left here three years later, he had gray hair. Sort of reinvented what law students are supposed to do. Um, but I had a very clear vision of what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a really good student, but I also wanted to enjoy the process. And I know that's tough. And I know it's particularly tough now because you're also dealing with the overlay that it's tougher to get a job in this economy and what you're going to do when you graduate, all of those kind of things. And I just want to assure you, and I really believe this from the bottom of my heart, it's the same advice I give my kids. If you have a law degree, it will open up more doors than any other degree you will ever come close to. You look at the Fortune 500 CEOs, the majority have law degrees. So I'll give you a little bit of background on what I did. I graduated, um, I clerked for a uh, firm in Century City. It's the only story 
I'm going to tell you because it was so horrific, but I learned a lot. <laughs> and it was a really great, I always loved real estate, and it was a really great real estate litigation firm called Firestein and Sherman. A guy named Harvey Firestein was about this tall. And he had, and he was a little bit, and I, I mean this with all due respect, this is going to sound terrible, going to be completely politically correct here. He was a very short man, had a deformity, he had a large hump on his back. But he was the lawyer you never wanted to be on the opposite side of the courtroom because he was so smart, so brilliant about real estate. So I was determined to get a job with Harvey Parson. And I got a job with Harvey Parson. I never wanted to do litigation, but I figured it was worth you know, spending a summer learning from this guy. And here's what I learned from this guy, is you start at the bottom. So my third weekend, the first couple of weeks, you know, I'm doing memos and I'm doing pleadings. I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> I had just been law school for a year. I'm completely lost. And Harvey comes into my office and I was absolutely petrified. He said, all right, kid, come on, come with me. We're going down to court. We go down to the courtroom and he said, you're bad. Your job is to carry my bag. Fair enough. <laughs> and we go down to the courtroom downtown and I'm carrying his bag. And he said, I gotta go to the bathroom. I said, great, sir, I'll wait for you right here. He said, no, you won't, it's a true story. He said, you are going in there with me. I said, oh my God. I said, really, that's not necessary. I'll be right here. I said, now you're going in there with me. And I had to walk in there. And it wasn't number one. And I said, why do I need to do this? He said, I'm a short, deformed man. And if you were a short, deformed man, you would not go to the bathroom in a county courthouse by yourself. And there I stood. I walked out of that bathroom and I thought to myself, probably the most humbling thing I've ever done, but it also taught me a great lesson. If you got to start from the bottom, it's the best place to start. Because everything from that point was all upside, right? <laughs> And so I really, you can't fall out of the hole. <laughs> but I learned so much from this guy. And I have never been scared to start from the bottom. When I finally got my full-time job, it was with one of the largest, in fact, at the time, the largest law firms in the country called Finley Cumble Wagner. And I went into the corporate securities department. Uh, at the time, we had about 800 lawyers, which was unheard of in those days in 1983. And I started there. I was there for about six and a half years. And Finley Cumble, the joke was crumbled. The senior partners were taking so much cash that financially it just crumbled. A guy walked into my office one day, about six or seven years, and said, here's the check, and you better run downstairs and cash it. I'm not sure it's going to clear tomorrow. And by the time I got down to the bank, there was about 300 lawyers in front of me cashing checks. But that was a good experience. I was back down to the bottom. And I went home to my wife. We had just gotten married. I said, congratulations. I'm out of a job. <laughs> Didn't you do well? <laughs> and I was going to go work for another law firm. And it was Tina who said, you've always loved real estate. Now's the time to do it. Just go do it. And I took with me my uh, assistant named Laura Phelps, who was just a terrific lady, uh, who actually made me look much better as a lawyer as I ever was, because uh, she cleaned up all of my work, and I started my company. So here we are. So you're graduating from the, one of the best law schools in the country. It probably did more to define my ability to succeed than any school I went to any experience I had, it all happened up here. Um, because my last story of starting from the bottom was, I think, in this room. And it was my first or second week in class. If all of you remember that, scared to death, have no idea what's going on, in contracts with a great professor called Professor Keyes. Have any of you seen the movie Paper Chase? <laughs> right? He was like one of those professors, right? very serious, a little bit disheveled, sort of this crazy professor kind of look, brilliant guy. And I was going to prove that I had some level of intelligence, so I'm going to ask a question. And I raised my hand, the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> he says, 
says, Mr. Caruso. And I said, sir, I have a stupid question to ask you. And he said, Mr. Caruso, stop right there. I swear to God, these are his words. Second week of law school. There are no such thing as stupid questions. Only stupid students. <laughs> Welcome to law school. <laughs> anyway, let me tell you a little bit about our properties. I'm going to sort of go off the cuff here a bit. Sam, who works with me, has been kind enough to sort of help uh, go through the slides, but I've been really lucky. I started this company on a shoestring uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, my dad gave me an opportunity to buy real estate that his company needed. Uh, while I was practicing law, because I really didn't want to practice law long term. I never really intended to practice law actually for longer than I, I wanted. But um, so what I was able to do was to create a little bit of cash flow by buying properties, leasing it back to his company, and then I took that same model and did that with other companies that were like my dad's, because I knew that there was an opportunity there. And then what I did, I started my first property was was actually a little duplex. But we've been able to build some great properties, and all of them I would consider to be first-class properties. We try to redefine the products that we have. And so we can go on to the next slide, I think. And let me tell you our approach. So what we like to do is we like to mitigate risk. We like to redefine the marketplace. Um, I feel very strongly that there's great opportunities in real estate. If you get a great property, you should never sell that property. And uh, our approach has allowed us to um, create properties that are some of the best in the world, actually, in terms of performance. So here's what makes us different. Uh, we consistently outperform our competitors. Our guests stay three times as long. 92% uh, of our guests actually make a purchase. I'm gonna watch my watch here, hold on a second, because if I talk too much, then we don't get questions, and questions are much more interesting. Um, we, uh, we spend nearly double when they're on our property, which is obviously important when you're in the retail business. Our sales per square foot are 75% higher, and our tenants' growth on our properties grow three times the national average. So we're very blessed because we got a lot of smart people and we've been able to redefine the product is what we've done. We've taken a mall and said so we don't like malls, we don't like indoor malls, we're gonna do things that are more organic, more outside, that, tend to go with the rhythm of how people live. And we're the only United States-based company that has two properties in the top 15 in the world, uh, which we're very proud of uh, that, rated by shopping centers today. So here's how we compare to our peer group. So everybody in blue are public REITs that report their sales. We're private. Um, I have no shareholders, I have no investors, I have no partners. So everything's on our own balance sheet. Was the way I wanted to do it was to build my own company. So we can make decisions very quickly because we have a, effectively a committee of one. We get a lot of opinions. <laughs> I get told very often that I don't know what I'm doing, and they're usually right, but uh, we have a committee of one. Uh, our properties are 98% leased. We're sort of actually closer to 100 uh, on all of our properties. The national average, I think, is about 92%, so we outperform there. Um, visitors, the average spend, that's really important in our business, right? The average spend in a U.S. mall is about $500 a foot. Uh, we're about double that uh, on average. So in terms of if you're a retailer or a restaurateur on our property, you're doing twice the volume that you'd be doing in a neighboring mall. Um, the important thing to know also is the Grove, which is a bit of, how many people have been at the Grove? Oh, I love this class. <laughs> And I did bring you gift cards only because it really makes all of you so much more welcoming when we announce it. <laughs> uh, and if we need more, we'll get more up here. But um, the thing about the Grove, 900 is a high watermark for the Grove. Our industry. The Grove, we do about 2,000 a foot in sales. It's really a remarkable property, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, everybody know what Cater is, your compounded annual growth rate? Um, you know, the cater is a very sort of tough thing to keep performance up over 20 years. We've averaged 18% growth, even through the downturn uh, in the recession. Actually, our annual line of profits grew when the market went down, uh, which was, we were very proud of how we managed our way through that. 
So here's the Grove. The Grove has become this amazing landmark. It's become part of the vocabulary of Los Angeles. I wish I could tell you how it happened. I don't. Um, I think one of the reasons it happened, in addition to a lot of smart people, is that I didn't grow up in the real estate industry. So I never knew how to build a wall, right? And this is a good lesson for all of you. And I don't know if your teachers are going to like this lesson. But sometimes the more you don't know, the better you are. Or you have to challenge what people are telling you is the only way to do something. Because that's just not true. There's never only one way to do something. If you look at the world today, everybody that's being successful, and I hate this word, but I'm going to use it, everybody who's successful has found a, a way to disrupt the normal way of doing business. Right? So you can take that to the extreme with Facebook and Twitter on how you communicate. You can take it to uh, Jobs with Apple. Steve Jobs never meant a thing. He just made what was out there better and then convinced us we needed it. Right? That's all I've done. And I'm not Steve Jobs. I'm not suggesting that by any stretch of the imagination. I've taken a shopping experience and we figured out how to make it better. And then we convince you that this is the place you want to go. And when you get there, we make you feel really good about it. And it has nothing to do with shopping, by the way. Where a mall is designed for people to shop, we design our places for people to hang out. Because once I know you're there and hang out, you're going to shop. And you're going to stay longer. And you're going to probably have dinner. And you're going to have a glass of wine. And then your defenses are down. <laughs> Of what a shopping center is like. And that's what people are doing. Um, Nordstrom, they just redid this building. They put $40 million into it to redefine what a Nordstrom should be. And they did it at the Grove because, believe it or not, it had the highest sales growth of any Nordstrom in the world. That's amazing. And it's one of the smallest, by the way, because we couldn't get a lot of real estate. Uh, we, we spent $5 million on a lobby in the parking garage. People say you're crazy. We're not crazy. We're welcoming you. You're our guest. None of you are my customers. My customer is Nordstrom. That's what we challenge the industry also. You're my guest. So every day what we think about is what's the right guest experience? How are we treating you with the property? Are we welcoming you? Are we saying hello? Are we saying thank you for being here? Right? You don't pay my bills. Nordstrom pays my bills. Well, without you, they can't do the business. So we're going to make you feel as welcome as possible. We're going to surround you in glamorous service because we want you to come back more and more. So there's the growth of Christmas time. We made a bold statement. We're going to celebrate Christmas, folks. We're not going to be shy. We're going to actually celebrate everything, for that matter. But we're going to actually use the word Christmas. When I was a kid, cities used to decorate themselves, and it was fun to go out on Thanksgiving Eve when all the lights would go on. And then all of a sudden somebody decided to be politically correct and can't do that. The best you can do is put up an ugly banner that says Seasons Greetings. <laughs> right? It's sort of like with a skull shape that they tell you in the morning. Seasons Greetings. Let me know what you mean. <laughs> what we say to people is Merry Christmas. Because what we learned is it doesn't matter what religion you are, Christmas means something to the heart. And what we care about, in addition to market share, is heart share. Do you love being on our properties? If you love being on our properties, you're going to come back there over and over again. The Americana brand, how many people have been out there in Glendale? Oh, great. I love that group, too. Um, it's a remarkable property. We took a town that was long forgotten, and people said, past the DNS or past it, and all this other kind of stuff. And our challenge was, can we go into this town and actually reinvent it? And now, the Americana brand, brand new Nordstrom, a brand new Bloomingdale's, a Tiffany's, a Din Tai Fung. Has anybody been to Din Tai Fung? The most incredible dumplings in the world. It took us five years to convince this guy. He's got a bunch of them in, in, in Asia. I promise you, if you go there, you, you think they're candy. <laughs> and there's a two-hour wait almost all day long. And it's a small restaurant, about 5,000 square feet, that's going to do $12 million. 
So a lot of people say, you know, how are your foundries going to compete with online? Online is a force, and it's an important force, and we have to recognize that. So our job every day is to make that guest experience better that you can't have online, right? So the example I always use, there's always been multiple ways for people to buy product. Years ago, Sears had stores, and they always had a catalog. We're all too young to remember the catalog, but they had the Sears catalog. And so now, instead of the catalog, you have online, which makes the brick and mortars of the world, the storefronts of the world, you have to create that experience that engages the consumer. But that's how you can disrupt online sales, by creating a great experience. This guy who did not funk creates that experience. You should actually go and see it. It's a phenomenon. 8500 Hurd Way, we got into the residential business. We first built 242 units out of the Americana. Uh, and then we really liked that business. We wanted to reinvent it. So how are we going to reinvent? How are we going to challenge the rules of a partner level? It's pretty straightforward. Well, what's the one thing you really need? And you should know this as a law student. What's the one thing you really need that you can't buy? Any guess? I don't know. What? Love? Actually, you can buy that. I can't. That's why they don't like me to come on. No. Yes, sir. Time. Bingo. Time. So, if I can give time back, to our residents, which we call their homes, if I can welcome you home and give you time, I think I create that hardship. So how am I going to give you time? Well, I'm going to build a better product, I'm going to make it nicer and all those kind of things. That's a given. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a 24-hour concierge that's going to be your beck and call. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to operate our residential as if you were in a five-star hotel. Not a three-star hotel, a five-star hotel. So at 8500, for example, we have a BMW and driver at your disposal at no cost, wherever you want to go. We have concierges 24 hours a day. They can make your plane reservations, your dinner reservations, they can have flowers sent, they can do whatever you want within the law. <laughs> we have what we call pantry service. When you go to work, we do your grocery shopping for you. By the time you come home, it's all done. We have room service, breakfast, lunch, and dinner actually about 18 hours a day from one of the greatest restaurants down below that we put in, run by Susan Going. You lay by the pool, and it's a beautiful afternoon, and you want a bottle of wine, it gets brought up to you. Anything that you want that you could get in a hotel will do here. The difference is you're coming home, and we welcome you home. That building was underwritten at almost the highest rents in LA. So when we started this project, the market had just crashed. We made a decision, let's build into the crash, because we're gonna take a bet that by the time the building's done, we're gonna start coming out of the crash. But by building into the crash, we had a very uh, open and welcoming city. It's typically not open and welcoming, because they were desperate to try to get things built and increase some tax revenue in the city of Los Angeles. We got the building built, Everybody know what CEQA is? Have you studied that? California Environmental Quality Act. In order to do a building like that, you have to comply with CEQA, which would take maybe a year and a half, millions of dollars to study every impact. We had full community support. We did it on a mitigated negative debt. We got that whole building. That piece of property was like a postage stamp. Three-story high limit, no retail, no residential. It could only be office. We broke every rule, no setbacks, eight stories, residential and retail. Got approved by the city, never got sued by anybody. Built it, underwrote it to $3.75 a foot for residential. That was about the highest rent in LA. So if you were renting a thousand square foot apartment, it was roughly $3,700 a month. 100% lease within a year. We now have a waiting list to get in there. The last deal we signed, $10 a foot. Why are people prepared to pay three times the market to live with us? I'm welcoming you home. I'm giving you time. It's something so precious 
The thing I love about this building even more than that is 50% of the people who live in that building live outside of Los Angeles, and 50% of those people live outside the country. So we have a very international crowd that lives in that building. It's a, it's a remarkable building. So obviously, we're not that foolish. We're doing more of these because there's a market. Nobody's really tapped into that luxury market on the residential front. There are apartments, not condos. We'll never sell these. So real quick, my future retail, and I think I'm close to wrapping up. Um, this is your typical mall. We don't think that's the future. We think that's the past. Uh, mall started about in the 50s and 60s. I think it's a historical anachronism. Um, you can go on YouTube. I gave a big speech in New York to about 6,000 people in the retail sector. And I basically said the indoor mall is dead in 10 to 15 years, and I believe that, uh, unless it's completely reinvented. Nobody wants to go to that, nor should you. If you go back and look historically and you ask the question, how does retail survive in the physical sense? There's so many great examples, but I use a couple of them. Sean's did he say? It's been there since the 1600s. It got its name in the 1700s. It is always packed. Great cafes, great stores. People naturally want to be outside. There's a natural rhythm to being outside. It's unnatural to go in and spend a day shopping. So people say, well, you can't do the grow when it's cold, right? Well, I'm true. The highest sales per square foot anywhere in the world is on the street. It's never a mall. So there isn't a mall in New York that does better than Fifth Avenue or Madison Avenue. There isn't a mall in Chicago that does better than Michigan Avenue or Rush or Oak. There isn't a mall in Rome that does better than the event. It just taps into how people live. Up on the top is the Skigi Market. Is that Skigi? Yeah, Skigi Market up in Japan. It's been there since the Edo period. I don't think they're worried about Amazon. <laughs> right? Below it is the uh, souk in Marrakesh. Been there for a thousand years. None of those merchants are worried about Amazon because they make this connection to their consumer, to their guests, and there's an experience and it taps into the fabric of that community. The stroll in Copenhagen, the longest street in Europe, it's a phenomenal street, just packed, it's vibrant, it's alive. Up on the top is Florida Avenue, down at uh, Buenos Aires, I think that's Buenos Aires. And then down below is one of my favorite streets in the bottom right, is Maiden Lane in San Francisco. And for what it doesn't have in length, it's a little short street, it makes up in character and charm and you just want to be there. And when you just want to be there, that's when you turn it into sex. We've got an opportunity we have bought, I don't know how many people know Pacific Palisades, the community in West LA, but I just bought the downtown street of Swampland. And he's been in the business for a lot of years of creating a downtown, creating a street like the road. And by the way, to do that, we went all over the world studying the heights of curves and the crown in the street and the rhythm of the trees and where the street lights go. And when you walk the grove, you shouldn't really notice anything, but it should all feel right. The grove was patterned out of King Street in South Carolina in terms of the dimension of the wood building front to building front, because I really like the scale of that. The Americana brand was more patterned after Newberry uh, in Boston because it had residential above it. And the interesting thing about that is residential above retail today, the floor plates are all about the same height when you look at it, because the developer is trying to save money. When you look at it historically, the floor plate of the retail Newberry Street, Madison Avenue Road, is always taller and prouder than the residential floors above it. That's because from a pedestrian standpoint, it held you in there. And what they were really selling was the retail component. So when you look at the Americana, you'll notice that the storefronts on the retail are taller than the height of the residential above. But so now we have an opportunity to reinvent our own downtown, which is going to be really cool. Part of it is we're teaming up with Jack Dorsey, who founded Twitter, and founded a company now called Square. And so there's going to be a whole backbone of technology that makes the shopping easier, that Jack and I are working on. 
But the charm of the street is going to be just the most compelling, wonderful street. Well, when you walk into a store, and as long as you click on the app, which we're going to start doing at the Grove, but more so here, it will welcome you. You walk and you say, welcome Ron Phillips, we'll come up on your phone. Last week, you bought three cashmere shorts. Down the street, there's a sale of cashmere shorts, if you like them. And depending on the color, just tap the button, we'll buy them, charge automatically, and have them delivered to your home. That's where I think retail store. Make it charming, make it compelling, make it easy, loop the technology that also makes your life more fun and gives you bad time. Miramar Beach, uh, I bought 18 acres on the beach up in Santa Barbara in Miramar. Um, hotel has been up there for about 100 years. We had uh, Ian Schrager and um, who's the other guy? Blank on his name. Had it before. Ty Warner started of being Baby's Water. The community fought them and fought them and fought them about redeveloping it. We bought it, probably a crazy thing to do. I've never done a hotel. But the idea here also is to reinvent the hotel experience. We're spending a lot of time how you do that. It will be the only five-star hotel on the beach that you can actually walk out of your room and hit the sand. And we're pretty excited about it. Hopefully we'll start construction next year as the hotel market gets a little bit firmer. We think we're about ready to do that. But it's a gorgeous piece of real estate. And then we have a big project in Carlsbad right off the Cannon Road that we're building um, something similar in scale and size to the road um, that we're involved with. So we've got that and a lot more projects that we're working on, uh, all that are, are very fun. And then we had a crazy idea, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. I'm a big believer in neighborhoods. And I think Los Angeles should start celebrating your neighborhoods. And the Grove has really reinvented that whole neighborhood around that area. you got a great area, the LACMA, um, the Academy is building a museum. It's, it's a cultural part of Los Angeles. And then Third Street, and Melrose, and Brea, and Beverly, are all these dynamic streets with great retail, great restaurants. It's one of the few places in LA that's actually 24 hours. There's a great energy to it. So everybody made fun when I first built the trolley. Well, why the hell did you build this trolley? Right? The trolley doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> but what's amazing is millions of people ride it. And it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> right? I mean, think about it. Every day, my office is at the grill. I'll walk downstairs and I'm having a meeting going to lunch. I'll look at the trolley and our conductor's all dressed up, saluting and the whole bit. It's packed with people that go nowhere. <laughs> so what if I can take the trolley somewhere? just to prove that this city should have a transportation system that actually is interesting to ride and celebrates a neighborhood. So Sam and I came up with the crazy idea, we're gonna take the trolley, we're gonna extend the trolley, off the road, we're gonna go down the street, and we're gonna connect to LACMA. And from LACMA, there's the Expo line that's coming up. But just that one connection, and hopefully we'll go down Third Street, and by the way, connect to the Liberal Center, our competition. I, I'm good with that. I think competition's help. And then you'll enliven all of First Street. And someone can park the road, hop on the trolley, go shopping and grab a bike on First Street, go visit Lacma, and then come back. I think that's the future of Los Angeles, which should happen and celebrate downtown. So we actually are processing the study. We're in our second phase of this. People thought originally we were nuts. But we're going to make this happen. We're going to do it. I think it's going to be terrific. So with that, thank you very much. And we'll open up the questions.